Welcome to the LA Real Estate Podcast. It's our podcast on buying and selling real estate here in Los Angeles. Today, we're going to go a little in depth into inspections because it's important and there's a couple key issues that we want to talk about. Then we're going to talk about investment properties and we're going to go over 10 upgrades that are no longer cool. No longer cool. And you definitely want to be cool. You want to be super cool. All right, Tanner. Yes. How are you? I'm good, Sarah Barra. Ah. Uh, how are yeah, you doing? I'm good. The kids are out of school. That's exciting. Well, for them. <laughs> <laughs> no, actually, it's really cute. On the last day of school, I had to work, so um, one of our good friends texted Clark and said, hey, I'm taking the kids mm-hmm. to Universal Studios. Do you guys want to come? Oh, fun. Yeah, so they so Clark surprised the kids and took them to Universal Studios. Oh, and that's they great. were up until 10 o'clock at night, which was the basically the best day of their life. Oh, that's awesome. Yeah, I worked, so that was that was there good. Actually, but I was, you know, it was nice to actually have, I could focus. It was mm-hmm. great. The kids mm-hmm. had a great time. Mm-hmm. And yeah, so they're off for summer. They start camp next week. And then we're headed up to the Yukon for a little visit with my family. Very exciting. Yeah, I can't wait. What are you doing this summer? Um, working on the guest house. Whenever I leave here today, I'm going to go work on the guest house still. I've got to yank down all the existing interior sheetrock to oh. expose the framing to get the approval of the inspector so that I can put new sheetrock up. It is a process. <laughs> Yay. Hooray. But then you're going to have a rental property. But then so I'm going to have a rental property. That's so exciting. I'm super excited to talk about this. Okay, so... Today, we're going to talk about some of the most common issues found during an inspection. Now, we've covered Mm -hmm. these before, but they are so important that I thought, hey, let's talk about them again. Inspections are a really big deal. And actually, you know, they're at the top of my mind right now because I've got a few inspections going on. I have a few escrows and one repping, actually both repping the seller, but we've been doing a lot of inspections lately. So I thought we could just kind of give a rundown again. Um... So remember, this is something really, really important too. Yes, you're getting inspections. Your inspector, if they're really good, is going to give you a really good idea of the condition of your house, show you any red flags. But it's super important to remember that your inspector does not see inside the walls, is not a psychic. They will not see every single inch of the property. So although they can give you a really good idea... Sometimes you can buy a house and things come up later, and it doesn't necessarily mean the inspector was a bad inspector. It's just they can't predict if there's going to be a burst pipe in the wall. Mm -hmm. You know, they can't see that. They could maybe say, oh, well, the plumbing's a little dated, or we actually even have new construction where things come up. I mean, it's you can't always predict. So, look, you're buying a house. There's innately a risk that goes with that, that something could go wrong. Um, but anyways, I thought I'd talk about some of the biggest things that come up. This is during like the riskiest things. Yeah, this is the biggest thing during inspections. So one thing always that we inspect is the roof. And it's really interesting. I see the same issues with roofs over and over yeah. and over. And one of them is flashings. So often flashings have been done incorrectly. Uh, flashings are supposed to, you know, go around and then the, um, the shingles are supposed to go on top of that. But often we see the flashings go over top. So water is very damaging. Water will always find a way to get through or go somewhere. And we also see little, um, areas kind of divots in roof and water will pool. Don't want water pooling on the roof. Yep. Because eventually it'll kind of work its way in. So we see that a lot. We see lots of dips in the roof where um, kind of it wasn't installed that properly. Absolute worst case scenario, you have to replace the entire roof. Mm -hmm. What's kind of good about that is roofs are so much better than they used to be. Mm -hmm. So we replaced our roof and, um, you know, it cost about, I think, $12,000. We did it with a permit. We used a very reputable company. That, I'm that sure. sounds like a, an affordable roof replacement. Yeah. Normally, they're a lot more expensive than I'm that. sure we could have gotten it for a lot less, actually. Mm-hmm. Part of the cost is going to depend on the pitch of the roof. Oh, yeah. You know, there's a lot of factors that go into it. However, our our roof warranty is 40 years. Oh, geez. Yeah. So 
you know, yes, if the roof needs to be replaced, that's not very much fun. However, roofs last a really long time now. So if you do decide to redo your roof, you want to make sure you get a really long warranty. Use a reputable company. But that we see a lot of roof repairs. We see um, you, you're not supposed to have more than three layers of shingles. Mm-hmm. So um, we often see, I think that's the right term for it, the shingles, the asphalt shingles. Sure, yeah, yeah, those are shingles. Yeah, so you're not supposed to have more than three layers. So if there's a roof that has three layers, you know the next step basically is to redo the yep. roof. Uh, but we see a lot of roofs with like little divots and the eaves usually kind of some termite damage on the eaves. We see pooling water. Um and then we also see, you know, a lot of roofs. The flashings are done incorrectly, and maybe it has two layers. Mm-hmm. That's very, very common. Mm-hmm. That's, I would say, probably like 80% of all roofs are sort of in that condition. Uh, chimneys. Chimneys are another big repair. There's very few. So, look, we're in L.A. The houses can be like 100 years old. Oh, yeah. Codes have completely changed. Um, now most old chimneys are considered decorative which basically yeah and well and also look here's the thing also in los angeles it's it's going to get up to what 115 this summer <laughs> yeah. our our decembers you know while they get cool you don't need a fireplace for heat in los angeles like yeah. you do in wisconsin you're probably going to be using your fireplace on christmas yeah. and maybe once in january yeah. you're not going to use it a lot during your inspections, most likely there will be issues with your chimney. If Absolutely. your house isn't yeah. brand new, there's going to be issues. We find a lot of small cracks. A lot of the time, um, the chimney sticking out of the roof is not high enough to, to conform to today's code. So if there's fire, the, if the fire gets too hot and some of the flames come out of the chimney, you know, if it's too close to the roof, mm-hmm. it can burn. Uh, we also see a lot of people that have modified the chimney, like put a new mantle on or painted the interior mm-hmm. of, of the, you know, the fireplace. And a lot of the time that wasn't done with the right proper paint that's not flammable. Um, so, yeah, so old chimneys are often nowadays considered unsafe. Again, not the end of the world, but you always want to ask your chimney inspector in, inspector. Is this something dangerous? If it was your house, would you feel okay using this chimney? Sometimes they'll say, look, if it was my house, Mm -hmm. I would use the chimney, but obviously I wouldn't use it if I, you know, I wouldn't leave a fire going unless I was home and, you know, have a, be very cautious. Yeah. And, and I don't know, I feel like it deserves repeating and this is los angeles and chimneys and yeah so it's like yeah we're not gonna be using them a lot they're decorative more than anything else people put the nice little glass rocks in there and call it a day it was really funny i had an inspection once in altadena and the chimney inspector he was really young mm-hmm. i mean he looked like fresh out of high school and he was very matter of a fact and kind of robotic and he was like this this chimney and this and this is wrong and this is wrong and this is wrong and it's tear it and and this and basically if you use it you could die. You know, he was so, he was so alarmist and crazy. Mm -hmm. And I was like, oh man, like you guys should just maybe not use this chimney. And then he turned around and he said, but if it was my house, I'd still use it on, you know, Christmas. And and I was like, (laughs) what? Crazy chimney guy. Yeah. Yeah. So I was like, oh, okay. But anyways, you know, there's risks with chimneys, especially with old chimneys. Uh, You know, maybe he's a little crazy, you know, like that movie, one flew over the cuckoo's nest. (laughs) Flew, get it? Blue chimney. Thank oh, you, Tanner. I Thank don't know. I give that Woo. one maybe a, a three out of Woo. ten. That one's hot. <laughs> Coming in hot <laughs> yeah. with the chimney joke. <laughs> <laughs> okay, that was like a nine out of ten. You were coming in oh, hot. I've been stoking that fire. Oh, oh God. unstoppable! Jesus. Oh, the puns. oh my God, the He's terrible. He's the pun. The pun terrible. king. Okay, uh, foundation. Let me read this one because I, I don't have yeah, anything yeah. going on. Old brick foundations. <laughs> <laughs> Well, uh, an old brick foundation can be very difficult to fix. Uh, biggest risks, obviously, are cracks, uh, windows breaking from major foundation repair, and the slab can be hard to fix. Uh, fix, obviously, plumbing. Yeah. So, okay. So, there's a couple different types of foundations, right? The really old houses are brick foundations, and those can kind of crumble. That's like a super sort of old apart. foundation. Yeah. I don't even see those very. Yeah, often. we see them quite a bit in houses that are, you know, a hundred years old. Um, So with foundations, you always want to think worst case scenario if you have to fix. So if you do, if your inspector says, eh, this foundation's a little 
hokey. That's when you want to get a foundation company to come mm-hmm. out and give you an idea if it's safe, if there's anything you can do to improve it, just to understand what it is, mm-hmm. and and if it's a major, major, major repair. Now, the thing with foundation repairs is sometimes can they jack up the house and fix the foundation? Yes. But the risk of that is all your windows breaking, major cracks through the walls, and, you know, it's they, they can't ever say that's not going to happen. I just don't know that there's a scenario in which if the foundation needed – if the house needed to potentially be jacked up, that I would be willing to buy the house. Yeah, it's just, a lot of risk. Just I, because, like, we do get shakes. Right. We get little shakes. We get little earthquakes. And if there's already foundation damage, I mean, would, would you tell someone to avoid a house that needed foundation repair? Only if it was a major foundation repair. You know, we see small cracks. We see – if you're buying a 100-year-old house, but the, but the, the other side of that is a house that's 100 years old, old was probably built – much, much better, better Mm -hmm. quality. You know, the wood is gorgeous and they can be really outstanding. Mm -hmm. I wouldn't take on a huge foundation repair. Mm -hmm. If, you know, if you have contractor experience and you're not scared of it, maybe you're remodeling the whole house anyways. Right. Some broken windows and things aren't that big of a deal. It really all comes down to the numbers for me. Financially, if it still made sense, I would be willing to take it on. But I'd want to know worst case scenario from Mm -hmm. a foundation company. Okay, AC. So we see this a lot. Air conditioning units, furnaces, really, really old. That's not really a big deal. You just want to get an an estimate on how much to replace. Also, though, you see these old air conditioners from the 80s. A lot of them work really, really, really well, but they're huge energy hogs. Mm -hmm. So if you use your AC in L.A., which you're probably going to do for most of the year. Yeah, you are. You could be getting five hundred dollar power bills. I mean, oh, if not more than that, yeah. you'll hit that tier two and three electricity. Yeah, it's crazy. So sometimes it actually makes sense just to replace your HVACs. And again, there's credits for a lot of this stuff. Something that's really popular right now are the ductless systems, and we're seeing a lot more people using them. They're much less expensive. They still have a compressor outside, most of them, and there's like a little vent in every room, but you mm-hmm. don't need ducting. And in a small house, those can make a lot of sense. They're quiet, they're really energy efficient, and they're much less expensive. So if you're buying a house that doesn't have any duct work and you can't afford to put in a whole brand new HVAC system, you could consider one of these ductless systems. I think that's what I'm putting in the uh, the guest house is one of those. Smart. You see them in a lot of hotel rooms. Yep. Um, okay, plumbing. Oh, boy. Yeah, plumbing. So we always want copper. Uh, the old cast iron, it tends to leak and kind of disintegrate over time. Um, and check the water heater. So... You know, there's some benefits to tankless versus versus tanked water heaters. A lot of people are going tankless. Well, and here's the thing, too, is when the tankless tech and when that sort of stuff hit in the very beginning, same thing with the electric and the instance, uh, you know, 10 years ago, uh, the it all, it all worked, but it was still kind of new. Yep. Now these systems have gotten really good. Yeah, they're much better. Now, something to keep in mind if you're considering going with a tankless water heater I had the same issue because our tanked water heater finally died. When I bought my house 10 years ago, mm-hmm. the inspector's like, this isn't going to last long. Mm-hmm. 10 years later, we still had it. It finally died. I was like, oh. Um, so I was considering putting in a tankless water heater. However, if you have a tank, you know you have 50 to 60 sure. gallons yep. of clean water in your house if there's an emergency. And just because I have kids... Mm-hmm. I was like, you know what? We that never is some store... doomsday prep right yeah, there. <laughs> We've yeah. got the water heater water. But, we, you know, with earthquakes yeah. and stuff. So I'm like, you know what? I'm going to keep a tanked water heater. I like the security of knowing that we have, and I think ours is 60 gallons, mm-hmm. that we have 60 gallons of clean drinking water if there's ever an emergency. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. So I kept the tanked. But obviously you can go with tankless. Also, if the power goes off, you still have hot water. Mm-hmm. For a so, little while. For a while. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, for a while. Okay. And then, of course, electrical. Mm-hmm. This is another thing that comes up a lot during inspections. A lot, we find a lot of little electrical fixes. So outlets not being grounded. Uh, we find new, often new electrical mixed with old. Mm-hmm. And that's not that big of a deal. Sometimes the panels need to be upgraded. Upgrading a panel is about $2,000. That's a very common thing that we find, a really old panel. So all these things come up during inspections. None of this is a huge deal. It all comes down to money. 
So these aren't scary. If if your inspector says, oh, you know, the electrical panel's old and, you know, there's some cast iron plumbing and um, the roof has one layer, I mean, two layers on it, maybe in six years, seven years, you're going to have to replace it. Okay, none of this stuff is a big deal. Having said that, you want to make sure that financially it still makes sense. So you're going to have a timeline of when you need to repair things and you know in seven years you might be hit with a new roof, which could be $12,000. So, be aware. Yeah, just be aware and, and make sure that the numbers still make, make sense on the offer price that you're offering for the house. All right. Um, got another buyer's tip for you. We're going to sign up for the Brace and Bolt program, EarthquakeBraceBolt.com. Sarah, what is the Brace and Bolt program? So this is kind of neat. This is a government program that they'll contribute up to $3,000 to brace and bolt your foundation of your house. There are specific guidelines. So your house has to be built before a certain year mm-hmm. and it has to have a certain a certain type of pony walls and things like that. But just go to the website and sign up. And you can do this before you buy a house. Oh. And they actually will. So they start the program. I think they release it once or sometimes twice a year. And it's a type of a lottery thing. So just put your email in and then you'll get an email when they open the new program. And I've had probably about four or five uh, clients apply for this Mm -hmm. and they've all gotten it. No way. Yeah. So I don't think that many people know about it. I I didn't know about it before now Mm -hmm. uh, because I totally feel like it's one of those things where not everyone's aware of this. Right. So so sign up and then your email's on there. So when they release the new, you know, the new year of lottery, Mm -hmm. then you can apply. And hopefully by then you've also bought a house and you're in your new house and you can use this. There you go. Oh, we have an Ask Sarah Somebody wrote in a question? Someone wrote a question for me. Sally asks, what about investment properties? So, Sally, I'm so happy. Is this the Sally we know? Yeah. Yeah. (laughs) (laughs) Sally is like a really, really good friend of mine. Sally's great. We love Sally. Yes, but she did write in and ask about investment properties. bass player. Yeah, she's awesome. Okay, so what about investment properties? So all day long. If you can afford an investment property in LA, you are going to be ahead of the game because rents are very high. Vacancies are very low. Um, The last statistic I heard was that our vacancy rate is 3%, which basically means if you have a rental and you're charging, you know, a decent rent, not too high, you will have a tenant. And it also makes it a lot easier to vet tenants too, Mm -hmm. because you'll probably have more than one person Mm -hmm. interested in it. Yeah. So sort of investment a seller's market properties, in that absolutely. Investment properties are really good investments, and we don't know what's going to happen with the stock market. If the stock market could crash, things could go down. If I had a lot of money in stocks right now, I would probably cash out and I would buy an investment property because our interest rates are at a two-year low right now. Mm-hmm. So interest rates are really good. You know, they may go down even more. We're not really sure. Interest right. rates are really unpredictable. Having said that, the stock market is crazy high, and what goes up must come down. Mm-hmm. So I would, if I'm actually looking for one myself, an investment property. So something to understand about investment properties is usually you have to put 20 to 25% down if you're not going to be living in it, which would make it the investment. Now, is that just as a part of the loan? Yes. So, for instance, like that's one of my goals is I want to get this guest house scenario all fixed up, maybe get a tenant or Airbnb it, and then eventually my goal is to get an investment property. So my loan process for an investment property is different than the loan process of just a regular? It can be a little bit different. Your lender will put you in a different loan product, Mm -hmm. so it would be considered a not owner-occupied property, Mm -hmm. your interest rate might be a little bit higher because it increases the the risk of the loan, basically. And then um, I know there's programs you can put down 20%, but I think most standard in a non-owner occupied investment property is 25% down. So again, this changes all the time. I'm, you know, in a year from now, they might have different loan products, but I think that's pretty typical. If I, well, let me ask you this, like if, um, do I have to tell them? I mean, I know that sounds like a dumb question. Well, if, if I was going to buy like a vacation house right. for myself, and I'm using I air mean, quotes here, but then I rent it out in the meantime. Whatever makes you sleep at night. No, oh. um, you could be. It can be considered fraud if you oh, lie. Wow. <laughs> so, <laughs> so you don't want to lie. You don't want to lie. I would never tell you on air to do something <laughs> like that, Tanner. <laughs> on air, I would never tell you to, yeah, to to do that. But 
Um, now, now, could you be buying a property and plan to live in it and then change your mind after escrow? Yes, that can happen. Mm. So do, <laughs> do what you need to do. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> the looks that Sarah's giving me right now. Boy, if I could take a photo of that. Um, so, yeah, it's something to know. Now, really, 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 really crucial if you are going to be a landlord, you're buying an investment property, L.A. has very strict, 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 strict guidelines for your responsibilities as a landlord, for protections for tenants. It is important to know what your responsibilities are. And, you know, you really want to vet your tenant very, very, very well. Evicting a tenant is a very difficult process. You have to go to court. It costs a lot of money. In that time, your tenant could completely destroy your property. Um, but once, what's interesting to, to know is that there's actually, well, this is, what, this is what I've heard over the years. There's actually more bad landlords than bad tenants, mm. which is interesting. But it's it's really important to understand. Now, L.A., again, with rent control, um, if you have a duplex, triplex, fourplex that your property is built after 78, this might not qualify. But if it's built before you have a multi-unit property, it most likely falls under L.A. rent control. Hmm. Um, different for Burbank, though, Glendale, um, South Pasadena. Those areas do not have the same type of rent control. But L.A., Los Angeles, if... You know, your address is Los Angeles. You most likely fall under rent control if you're in a multi-unit property. Right now, we don't have rent control for single families. Mm -hmm. But again, that could change in the future. So um, understand your rights. It's really important to know that in rent control, you can't increase rent more than a certain percentage every year. You need to give written notices to enter the property. Um, there's a certain way you can do uh, late fees. And, and it's just there's the tenant booklet is very, very thick. Read through every single page of that if you want to be a landlord. You have to you absolutely have to know your responsibilities. Um, another thing is if you have a unit in your property and you're renting it out, and it's not a legal rental. So, for example, you have a single-family house, mm -hmm. and you've made a, an illegal basement conversion, and sure. you're renting it out. If you have a dispute with your tenant, they can go to court and actually sue you for all of their back rent, all of it. Mm -hmm. So if you've been you know, renting for many years, you could be in a lot of trouble. So mm -hmm. if you're renting, don't – this is my advice. Do not illegally rent out. It's not worth it. It's crazy. Try and find a legal rental and do things the right way. Um, save yourself that headache. Yeah, yeah. Um, also, if you're a landlord, you want to make sure that you have a reserve if something in the property needs to be fixed. Because, again, that's your responsibility. If the water heater is out, it's your responsibility to fix it. If your roof is leaking, that's your responsibility. Probably a good idea to have a home warranty mm -hmm. if you have a rental property, obviously. I know I know you you're sort of on the lookout for investment properties. Mm -hmm. What do you find what do you feel like the market is right now for duplexes? So the hard thing about duplexes there's not a lot of them on the market and a lot of them come with really long-term tenants. So mm -hmm. as much as obviously we want people to have a, an affordable place to live, but if you're buying a duplex and your tenants are only paying $500 rent right they've been there for 20 years and it doesn't cover your mortgage, you can't buy it. Right. I mean, you just, you know, you would be losing money every month. So it's hard to find duplexes that are vacant. Mm -hmm. um, and unfortunately, this is another sad thing. So with people paying way below market rents that have been there for a long time, unfortunately, a lot of the times the landlords just have they major stop taking care of the place. deferred maintenance. Right, yeah. Yeah, yeah. they become... Um, you know, if there's a leak, they just send out the cheapest person to fix it. They're not using pro professionals. They're doing the work themselves or not doing the work at all. And then the tenants don't want to complain because they're paying so low right. rent. So these properties get pretty dilapidated. We see that a lot. Mm. Um, so finding a vacant duplex is challenging. I think a duplex, though, is their perfect first time um you know, investment property, mm -hmm. because usually it's two separate structures on a lot. It can be combined, but most of the time, like in Cypress Park or Glassville Park, we see a lot of that. We mm -hmm. see two houses on a lot. They can be really good investments um, if you can find one that's vacant, because you could live in one and then rent out the other, and that pays for mo a lot of your mortgage. Mm -hmm. um, again, though, there's inherent risk when you have an investment property. 
there's risk. There's risk that your tenant will just stop paying rent and it takes three months Oof. to do an illegal eviction. And in that time, your property can be damaged. So you want to have reserves. I wouldn't buy an investment property unless I had a pretty good amount of savings in the bank, mm-hmm. just as a just in case. I've been um, as I've been sort of like thinking about and going or as I've been going through the ADU process and the things that I've learned from that, my new thought has been. Um, if and when I can get this like secondary property, that what I'm going to look for is I'm going to look for a place that I know could get approved for an ADU right? and then probably go with a prefabbed ADU. Yeah, I think that's a great idea. And I've actually been considering that as well. Now, something, though, is we don't know how long this ADU ordinance is going to mm-hmm. be around for. So what if you buy the place and three months after that, the ADU ordinance is gone? Well, that would be that would be the key is like applying right. for that ADU ASAP. Another thing to keep in mind when you're looking for an investment property, renters have different needs than buyers because they know they might not be in the place for a super long time. So, for example, they won't care as much about maybe the school district. You know, mm-hmm. if it's a if it's a younger people renting, they don't care so much about the schools because they're not going to be there forever. Um, things like a long set of stairs might not be the end of the world for them because they're like, ah, we can get by yeah, in a couple, still living there a couple, couple of years. years. So it, when you're looking for an investment property, some of the things that might be super important as a buyer for your own personal family home might not be the same as an investment property. So it's just something to keep in mind. Um, Also, when you're doing renovations for a rental, you really want to think about putting in materials that are more durable because tenants are harder on a home than owners are because it's not their stuff. And like say you are renting in Hollywood and you're in a band and you have 50 people over Mm. um, after shows some nights, they're going to be a little harder on the apartment. Like, like maybe an apartment that had a, had a whole bar inside of it at one point. So let me just tell you about my Hollywood apartment, okay? I had the most amazing Hollywood apartment ever. Uh-huh. It was a three-bedroom. We had a really affordable rent because this place was a dump. You lived down the street from an actual castle. Yes, it was me. Oh, that's right. On I was on Ivar. Mm-hmm. I had this amazing uh, rental, and my landlord lived really close, and he was super cool. But the very first piece of furniture I bought was a 10 foot custom bar that I found on Craigslist for like $200. Mm -hmm. And it was a whole thing trying to get this stupid bar. We had to rent a U-Haul. We finally got it. We got it up. We couldn't get it up the stairs. But thankfully, one of my roommates was like a Marine guy. Mm -hmm. So he helped carry it up. Do you remember this? The bar? Do you remember the bar? Oh my gosh. It was huge. The bar was amazing. It was a giant place too. And guess what? When I bought my house, I moved the bar to the new house and it just didn't fit. So I put it up on Craigslist. I sold it for fourteen hundred dollars. You're a monster. <laughs> <laughs> you're, you're an absolute scam artist. That was amazing. <laughs> you you bought and, a bar for two hundred bucks. And used I sold the- it for fourteen hundred. <laughs> and the guy that bought it was a professional race car driver. What? Yeah, it was a really crazy thing. He came to my house. He picked it up. He's like, oh, I have a, a hanger, an airplane hanger that I have for my cars, and I'm going to put the bar in the airplane Who hanger. Who did you sell this to? Jeff Gordon? I don't know his name. I wonder if I still have it in my old email somewhere. Yeah. It, and I'd then be curious. He got a little creepy, though, at the end. He was sending oh. me some kind of creepy messages. Like, I know the bar transaction is over, but if you ever want to meet for a drink. <laughs> wow. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yeah, good times. Room, My Hollywood apartment. Yeah. So uh, I don't know. What's the moral of that story? Get uh, get really cheap furniture on Craigslist and then resell it? Yep. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> That's it. That's it right there. That was another story. So um, Another story anyways. for another podcast. And, uh, yeah. So, <laughs> so that's uh, investment properties. Not for the faint of heart. Um, I really do recommend buying your own place before you consider buying an investment property. Oh, my gosh. I think gosh. it's important to go pr- through the process yourself. First, and then when you're feeling really financially secure, then consider an investment property. I don't think it's something that you should just jump into without owning your own home first. I really don't. Buyer's tip. Um, If you're planning to redo the floors, order material that is in stock. And remember that wood has to sit in a house for at least three days before you can install it so that it acclimates to the humidity and everything. Mm -hmm. And make sure you use a flooring person that uses self-leveling concrete to make the floors level. Yeah. So this is something one of my clients is using right now or doing right now. He's putting flooring in the house. So 
obviously when you – this is something really common. When people buy, they want to put new floors in. Mm-hmm. Because you don't have your furniture, the house is vacant, it's the less, the least expensive and the best time to do it, mm-hmm. to put the flooring in. Interestingly enough, we always want to install the floors first before painting. And I know that seems backwards, but the reason why is because when you're doing flooring, it's super dusty. And if you've just painted, all the dust will stick to the wall. Oh, boy. Yeah. So um, you want to put the floors in first. And all these old houses, there's a little bit of settling. So the floors are almost never level. So Mm -hmm. if you're putting new flooring in, have them use the self-leveling concrete. And they can actually sort of faux create a really level floor. And uh, yeah, you, you, you want the materials. When you're doing any upgrades before you move in, order things that are in stock. I can't stress that enough. We live in Los Angeles. Mm-hmm. There's tons of places lots to go lots of to. Outlets. But if they say, oh, this needs to be custom ordered, it'll be two to three weeks. Pick something else. Pick well, because what's going to happen? It'll be back ordered. It'll be back ordered. It's going to push you back in time. And then when you find out, oh, you're five, you know, five square feet off, and you right. need that last, few, those last few planks right. or whatever, you're going to be waiting on weeks to get them. Right. And over order too. Always have a little bit extra than you think you. I need. read that about tile as well. Yeah. Over over order by like uh, like twenty percent or something yeah. like that. I'm about to redo uh, the the flooring in my second guest room. Oh, what are you putting in? Um, well, don't say carpet. No, I'm ripping carpet up. Oh, so gosh. I'm in the process now. I'm, I'm basically storing a lot of junk in there while I'm redoing the ADU. But as soon as that's done, I'm ripping the carpet up. I've already ripped up a corner of the carpet because it's old and bad and ugly and right. blah, blah, blah. And there's tiling underneath there. Oh. And I did. And now it's gross. Oh. Uh, uh, um, but I did research <laughs> and evidently you can lay flooring directly over well-laid tile. You can. I would probably rip out the tile. Yeah? Mm-hmm. I think because it'll crack over time and it'll – I. I always recommend removing whatever's underneath. Sure. I don't think I would keep the tile. I would rip it out. But it's all up to you, Tanner. Yeah. We'll see. We'll okay. see how I feel after the old ADU thing. Here's – oh, man. This one I'm excited about because I haven't looked at this, and I'm about to find out how <laughs> uncool I am because we're talking about 10 upgrades that are no longer cool. Yeah, these are things to not do when you buy your new house. Again, we always talk about how when you buy your house, you want to do things that are going to make it better. Right. When you do your renos, always keep in mind you want to add things that are timeless. So mm-hmm. in 15 years when you sell, you don't have to redo anything, and it doesn't look dated. Now, Ten years ago, I bought my house, and really dark hardwood floors were in, and mm-hmm. that's what we have. Shiny, dark hardwood floors that now kind of look dated. But the good news is they can be refinished. But yeah. anyways, so number one, shiny, dark <laughs> hardwood floors. <laughs> so when you're doing flooring, uh, really avoid the super shiny flooring and you know try and put in something matte that's, mm-hmm. that's a lot more um, – it's less likely to show dust. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. And it's just a, a little bit more modern, a little more friendly yeah. for usage. Yeah, the shiny thing was really in, and I'm really regretting putting in super shiny floors. So, uh, um, yeah, as far as flooring too, you know, there's there's uh, laminate, there's hardwood, and there's engineered hardwood. And engineered hardwood is a really good middle ground if you can afford real hardwood. Mm-hmm. It's actually a little bit more durable than real hardwood too. Um, we really are avoiding like cork floors mm-hmm. and bamboo floors now are looking dated. Bamboo doesn't wear very well. And all the bamboo floors I'm seeing in houses that were installed 10 years ago look horrible. Mm. So I wouldn't do bamboo. Yep. Okay. Uh, granite is out. Quartz is in. Really? Yeah. People aren't into granite countertops No. Anymore? Granite looks like old lady granite. That's, that's what I have. I have the black granite. And I'm yeah. Like, Ugh. Yeah. You know, and countertops aren't crazy expensive. But I would, if you have granite, you don't have to take it out. Yeah, it's still durable. I mean, it's going to get the job done. It's just, it looks like granny house. But if you're doing a remodel in your kitchen and bathrooms, I just would recommend not putting it in right now. Our buyers are not looking for granite. This could change. Maybe in 10 years, granite comes back in. Um, the white marble counters are beautiful, but marble can stain and it's mm-hmm. not as durable. I really like quartz. Mm-hmm. Quartz is really durable, really classic, uh, very simple. So I would, yeah, quartz is out. Uh, quartz is in, sorry, and granite's out. Um, I like this one a lot. Uh, a lot. Stainless steel appliances. Uh, we're going with matte black, satin, and white. You know what? I got uh, matte black. In uh, satin washing machines. Did you really? Yeah, washing machines and dryer. Tanner. Yeah. I'm on trend. You are on trend. So 
stainless steel um, was popular for many, many years, mm-hmm. and it's still in. You know, a lot of people have stainless steel, but it's I not think, a bad look. No, I think people are just sick of fingerprints. Yeah. So the satin's a little bit better. It doesn't mm-hmm. show fingerprints as much. Um, but right now we're seeing matte black appliances, and we're also seeing these gorgeous high-end white stoves mm-hmm. that are stunning. A like white really, stove? Yeah. Oh, that just beautiful. sounds like a. That sounds like you'd be cleaning it. Well, nonstop. yeah. Stop. Yeah. I mean, if you're super messy, Tanner. I mean, most people clean their stoves. My stove is more or less. <laughs> my stove is more or less a shelf for Wait, pots I was that I don't say, use. Do you cook? Every now and then, I'll pan fry a steak. Okay, okay. I don't scramble know if some I've eggs or some bacon. Cook. No, you haven't. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> multicolored glass tile. Oh my gosh, this is what my backsplash is in the stove, and it looks like literally. I mean, I know the last time my kitchen was done, I think was the mid two thousands. Whoever yeah. owned the house then, the multicolored and it's super dated. yeah tile is starting to look super dated. Um, interestingly, though, the like the really pretty um, kind of green or blue tile that's mm-hmm. just one color and it's a little bit bigger. Mm-hmm. That I think still is beautiful and it's really classic. Um, subway tile, some people are debating about it. I love subway tile. I do too. I, I think it'll be in forever. I think it's classic. Well, and it's simple. It's simple. Anything simple, I think, is always better. Yeah. But yeah, I would not, if you're doing renos right now, I would not put in that multicolor tile mm-hmm. because I think in. Especially in five years, it's going to look super dated. Hold on. I want to read this next one verbatim. Carpet is Satan's blanket. Carpet bad, hardwood in. Yes. Satan's carpet. blanket. Carpet is out, out, out. So if I go to a listing appointment and mm-hmm. the seller says, what is the one thing I can do before selling this house that will make the biggest difference? Always removing the carpet. Mm-hmm. Car- and I don't know what it is, but it's always the people that have lots of dogs oh, and cats gross. that have carpet. Carpet is disgusting, in my opinion. If you pull up carpet um, and you see what's underneath it, Mm -hmm. it is really, really, really gross. Yeah, I've done that in the corners of that room, and it's absolutely terrifying and and disgusting. And no, you know, sorry to everybody who's listening right now that has carpet. Yeah, you suck. (laughs) Get your carpet out of here. What's wrong with you? You know, and it's not terrible. Look, if it's just you living or you and a partner living together, you don't have kids, you don't have pets, you're really, you know, you maintain... It's fine. It's not the end of the world. But buyers don't like carpets. And in L.A., it gets so hot. Oh, my God. And just like bugs and stuff underneath like, carpet. Well, what kind of human being are you with carpet? I don't know. I'm not. Just like. Yeah. Carpet's just not my thing. But it is Satan's okay. blanket. Okay. Satan's blanket. Uh, bowl sinks out. Farmhouse is still in. What? Yeah. These bowl sinks. You know the sinks that sit oh, atop. Oh, God. I hate those. Oh, they're the worst. So they sit on top of the vanities. They were super, super, super popular and high end. Was this like, like late 90s? 90s? Oh, yeah. 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 It was like cutting edge. Like, oh, my gosh. It looks like the I mean, bowl is floating on top of the countertop. It's a little piece of art. Yeah. I get it. Yeah. But it's not very practical. No, they're just, they're out right now. So listen, don't feel bad. If you're buying a house that has this stuff, mm-hmm. it's not the end of the world. They're functional. Yeah, they're if you have fine. carpet and bowl sinks. What we're saying right now is just <laughs> <laughs> if you're doing new renovations, right. don't add these things. Don't put yeah, these I things. I actually, so in. I had uh, a neighbor down the street and he listed with another agent first and Ooh. now he's listed with me. Okay. But anyways, um, he did bathroom renovations with this other agent. No. And he put in bowl sinks. Did you like, talk to him about it? Yeah. Were you like, the heck were you thinking? Yeah. I'm like, ugh, why didn't you call me first? Um, this is one that I, I want to hear what your thoughts are on this. Always keep a tub in the house. A lot of people prefer big showers. I'm a big shower person. Mm-hmm. I've got one bathtub. I'm thinking real hard about getting rid of it. But then I think about kids and somebody yeah. buying this house after me. You want you always want to think about resale when you're doing renos. So I don't think there needs to be a bathtub in every bathroom. And and our culturally, so in Europe, everybody has baths. Like mm-hmm. showers are not as common. I mean, mm-hmm. my parents have a bath every night. They don't have a shower. Um, I think our generation and Western, more Western people have a lot more showers. I think mm-hmm. we're always just in a rush. And, yeah. um, so I don't think every bathroom, in my opinion, needs to have a bathtub. Having said that, I think every house needs to have one bathtub in the house and mostly for kids. Mm-hmm. You know, if you have really young kids, it's really hard to have a shower yeah. with them. You have to be in the shower You want to hose them. them down. Yeah, yeah. So with a bathtub, you know, especially if they're two or three, they can sit and they love playing in the bathtub. Right. Um, 
Also, if you have a pet and you need to give them a bath or whatever, I, I just think it's really impractical to take all the bathtubs out of a house. So always keep one in. So I would recommend you keep one in. I've been trying to figure out how to sort of uh, upgrade that bathroom a lot. That's my guest bath where the tub is, and it's laid out so weird. Most bathtubs are uh, the short sides. Right. So you have one long side and two short sides against a wall. Right. Well, I have one short side and one long side exposed. I think I remember Which it. is like sort of bizarre. Yeah, you might be able to just change the layout a little and maybe potentially have a freestanding tub. You know, oh, wait, yeah. you do have a freestanding tub. No. Well, oh, you don't. It's one unit. Okay. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I can't remember what it looks like. I think it, you know, I think it's always nice to have a freestanding tub and then a nice shower. Like the bathtub shower combinations, sometimes you have to do because the bathroom's well, small. Well, that's what this room is. Yeah. It's, it's, so, uh, there's no other way around you it. You know, it's not the end of the world, but it, if it was me, I would keep the bathtub just for resale. Um, okay, be careful with solar panels mm-hmm. and, and just make sure that when you're having them installed, I I like so, solar panels, but just make sure they're not super, super, super visible because that can actually decrease your value and make your house less desirable. People for curb appeal, mm-hmm. they don't want to see a whole bunch of uh, solar panels. Yeah, it's it's uh, it's getting to be unavoidable, I think, yeah. unfortunately. For anyone who's listening, just like the price of electricity in Los Angeles is going to continue to go up over right. the next 20 years. The, the LADWP has let us know this. And with our temperatures very regularly, you know, reaching the one teens. Yeah, it's crazy. Uh, you know, it's getting hotter it's, every year. It's impossible to yeah. avoid. So I think solar panels are great. Um, just do your research and make sure that you're going to understand what it's going to look like when they're installed. Right, yeah. And you know what? It might be still be worth it. You're like, yeah. whatever. I, I, I don't want to be paying these crazy energy bills. I can't afford to not go solar. Right, right. So, you know, do do whatever, but just understand when they're going to install it, what it's going to look like. Okay, gray flooring is out. Gray flooring. Yeah, this is the the wood that sort of has the gray tinge to it. Oh, it was really, yeah. really, really popular, probably for the last few years, really trendy, mm-hmm. really... People are starting to not like it, and um, it's turning away buyers. So we see some of these Home Depot flips where the guys will go, and they'll get stuff from Home Depot and put them in and be like, ah, people love the gray floors. Mm -hmm. They're not loving them so much anymore. Mm -hmm. So these are the the kind of like laminate or engineered wood planks that Mm -hmm. have a grayish grayish finish to them. You know what would be fun is when it comes time – to it, it was like I've got to get all I've got to get all my ducks in a row. But if we wanted to go through and look at these, like what would be the maximum value upgrades? And I'll do that in my guest house. Oh, how fun! Yes. Yeah, like what the a good flooring idea. and the tiling in the bathroom and that sort of stuff. Oh my god, I'm so excited! That yeah. sounds amazing. Yeah. Okay, I'm totally on board. Okay, now number ten. Think classic and timeless. And what you can do if you want to make really bold choices. Do it with the fixtures that can be easily changed. Mm. So, for example, something that we're seeing right now that people love is like an antique bronze Mm -hmm. look with fixtures. So with pulls on the cabinets, with your uh, faucet in the kitchen, that stuff, go crazy because changing it is no big deal. And actually, in 10 to 15 years, you're probably going to need to change it anyways. Mm -hmm. Mm So those are things that you can make, you can be really, um, really easy bold swaps. and take some risks and do some whatever you want to do. And same with tile too, actually. Tile is kind of easy to switch out. It's not that expensive. So for example, you want a really kind of high-end kitchen, you can make some bold choices with the tile and then eventually change that out if you want. I thought about going bold uh, with the tile in my guest bath. Yeah, absolutely. And um, and tiles on trend right now. And, you know, in 10 years, maybe we'll be talking again and saying, um, now this is super dated. So really you want to keep the big things, uh, simple and clean and classic. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. And then the other stuff you can take risks on and be, um, yeah, takes, take some, some bold choices and colors. Another thing, paint. Mm-hmm. You can go as crazy as you want with paint because the worst case is you just paint it again. I've done that. And before you sell, you're probably going to paint anyway. Yeah. I, you know, in my hallway, I painted, listen, listen, listen up listeners. Um, I'm not scared <laughs> to make a bold choice. And I painted the ceiling of my hallway, a very bright tangerine. And it catches you off guard huh. when you walk in because you can't see it until right. you get into the hallway. And then it's it's this really bold like pop of color, and I have a very interesting light fixture hanging from the ceiling. I want to see it. Well, you have a mid-century house too, mm-hmm. so these bold pops of color 
are really cool. Another thing we're seeing right now, which is really popular, is bright doors. See, that's what I want to do. I want to swap out my front door. I my, love that. Uh, my front door is very boring right now, and I just swapped out a, a door in my in my guest room. Um, and so Can now you I'm, just paint your door? I can, but I also want to get something with a little design, oh, with yeah. some little windows. Because I love in mid-century houses like a teal or yep. a yellow or an orange that's door. That's what I want to do. Yeah, a tangerine door would look really pretty. All right, guys. So these are some of the things that you want to keep in mind when you're doing your renos. Renos. Um, don't go to Haywire and Trendy for big items like the flooring, um, you know, like some of the design elements. But take your risks and, and choices with things that can easily be changed. Guys, thank you so much for listening. This has been the LA Real Estate Podcast. I'm Tanner Thomason. And I'm Sarah Skelton. Do not forget in the podcast notes the Ask Sarah segment, whether it's life or music or real estate, she's got answers. I'm really good at giving uh, relationship advice, too. Oh my gosh. Yeah. We've had fun, haven't we, Tanner? So much fun. It's a good time. But yeah, feel free to get in touch with us if you have any topics and questions. And we love you guys. Really, thanks for listening. Yeah, thanks. It's so good. It's so good to be here with you.